Oh, and you could hear me, right? You can hear me? I can hear you better yeah. now. Yes, yeah. I'm going to use this. Great. Okay, so welcome back to the Francisca Show. This is a spontaneous episode that I am so fortunate enough to have pulled together thanks to our guest, Darcy and Cole, who I will introduce in just one minute, and thanks to Miriam Lane Gamliel and Avi Shag, who... Um, and everyone who has been requesting me to talk about this topic on this podcast. So it's finally due. This is such an important topic. If you listen to any episode on The Francisca Show, it should be this episode. Because if you create music and you do not know what the heck you need to do to protect yourself, the only thing you can do to protect yourself as an artist and to protect your work, then what fight are you fighting beyond that? You want to get paid to perform? And if you can't <laughs> have the autonomy and the rights to your own art and you don't know what, you know, how the industry works, then stop what you're doing and listen to this episode. And I'm also going to preempt this episode by saying that we are speaking to a, an expert here in the music business industry. And we are, and, and the reason I'm so passionate and I'm almost preaching here is because in the past 24 hours, I've heard from so many established artists, people who follow on Instagram probably today, who have no idea what the heck, <laughs> sorry, I'm saying that, but they do not know what registering your work means and they do not understand royalties and they have probably been, I don't want to say scammed, but they, 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 they're just totally oblivious to what's going on. And the first thing you need to know about your art and how to protect it should be done first. So, okay, 100%. if you hate me now with this introduction, if you're listening to this and you're like, Francisca, you know, I loved you until now and now you're just really driving, you know, making me really upset, I'm sorry, but I, I'm fighting the fight and this is probably, this probably should have been the first episode on the show. So I am giving myself a little bit of, what's the word? Um, You're giving yourself some co-op on the subject. Well, most are more like rebuke, rebuke on how come we didn't do this earlier. Oh, so, oh, oh, I see where you're going. <laughs> so welcome to the show, Darcy Nicole. Thank you. A music business expert living in Israel, and she is going to talk about the services she is able to offer on a one-on-one -on -one basis as well as class basis. This is definitely not going to cover every little detail because this we're going into a whole legal space here and people, people study this. People become experts as lawyers in this industry. So obviously we will not be able to cover everything, but we will try to give you the basics to understand what this is how it works and what you need to do as your next step as somebody who writes music, as somebody who composes music or lyrics, you know, what you need to know. So welcome, Darcy. Thank you so much, Francisca. I'm so excited to be with you. Yeah. So for anyone listening, Darcy has a, a, um, Darcy has studied in Berkeley College of Music. So if anyone doesn't know, that is one of the more prestigious music established academies and universities. <laughs> and we are getting expert information here. We are talking to somebody who really knows what they're talking about. And so happens to be, you are a firm Jewish woman. So yes. that is such a bonus. Okay. So in just a few sentences, tell us how you got started, um, how you started in the arts, How's that connected to your Judaism? Just give us a little bit of context of who you are. Okay, sure. It sounds great. So actually, I've been, I started out as a vocalist and songwriter. That's my first avenue and passion. And that's what led me to um, go to Berkeley College of Music. So I was working with a producer in Boston who was actually working as an admi uh, admissions counselor for Berkeley at the same time. And so that's where you need to be. And I said, okay. Okay. Uh, and I had never had music theory training, but I, you know, have been singing my entire life and writing songs since I was 12. And so as I got there, um, that producer actually used to work with a lot of really known artists and said, hmm, you have like a skill for A&R, which is a term for artists and repertoire, which is kind of a, not the biggest um, department at record labels anymore. It, it still exists, but it's not really as the same as it was back in the 1990s. I'm 
I'm dating myself, but that's okay. Um, and so anyway, he's like, you have a talent for that. You should study music business. I was like, wait, there's a music business major at Berkeley? He's like, yeah. So I decided that as a songwriter and artist, I better know what I'm doing on the business side of things. So that's why I ventured into that avenue of study because, you know, I can be performing anywhere. I don't have to study performance. Like, you know, I'm going to be performing all the time. I don't need to study songwriting. I'm songwriting all the time. So I didn't really feel like I would invest my education in that. So I went into music business and it turned out the industry had a huge shift right after I was like, right when I was in school and graduating. And so I ended up getting all these questions because I was like, I mean, not to sound like whatever, but I was literally the top of my class in music business at Berkeley. So everyone was always coming to me, <laughs> help, help, help. So um, one of my friends suggested, you know, you should do that. That's what you should do. And so I decided to do music business consulting. Um, and I was actually advising a lot of hip hop artists, which have a lot of issues with regard to samples. We could talk a little bit about that tonight. Um, and a lot of urban music artists that that's the kind of my focus of study is is urban music R&B and soul is my niche so I was advising hip-hop artists how not to get in trouble and um, That actually turned into hey, can you can you kind of manage me? I said well, I don't manage I don't have the bandwidth to manage but I love your music I want to get it out there. So that parlayed into a career in media publicity So it all kind of happened organically and so but I never stopped doing everything so I kind of still do all of those things, but the number one thing that makes me a little bit different than like a cold legal person who might just have studied entertainment law is that I'm actually one of the parties that's invested in the subject for myself as an artist. So I'm sensitive to the issues and the questions that com you know composers, songwriters, and recording artists have. So that's, that's kind of me in a sauce. nutshell. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, but I mean, it's not my own. It's not. It's not only my sauce, but it works that people know that I'm one of them. A hundred percent. Okay. So thank you for keeping that short because we have so much to discuss. Yeah, now. for sure. Okay. And so we'll start with this. And I, my questions are formulated in a way to make it as simple as possible to the listener to have practical knowledge to how, how to apply this to themselves. Okay, mm -hmm. so number one, and I'll use the word lechatrila because I couldn't find a proper word in English, but if you are starting from scratch or from the beginning and you want to do it properly, what do you need to do? And this, you can cover two topics here. Number one, original music and lyrics. Mm -hmm. Number two, if you want to cover a song, what do you do before you have already invested into your studio and making a music video and posting and then YouTube telling you they have to take Oops. it down? Exactly, <laughs> exactly right. So if you want to so do a cover song legitimately or you want to write your own music and lyrics legitimately to begin with, what do you do? So great. So that's great that we're having two streams. And, and if you want me to pause in between or stop and ask a question, feel free to interrupt at any time. Um, Cause it's, it's kind of like a long thing. And just, you know, I do teach this stuff too. So it's, it's something that I'm here as a resource for, for people. Um, so let's go with the easier thing, which is kind of, if you're on your own, yeah. okay, that's a little bit easier. That's what so I if do. You're, because yeah. <laughs> yeah. So if you're, if you're, first of all, you have to identify and know this is number one. So I'm going to, I'm going to take pauses a little bit after each one. So you can kind of write it down for those who are listening. Number one, identify all of your roles. Okay. So being an artist, okay, in terms of the, the songs and the music industry, every, every role is individual. And so one person can be doing multiple things, but you have to remember that each one of those roles is a different revenue stream. It's just like having a different job. So if you have three jobs, you get paid from through those three jobs. You don't just get paid as one person. The same is true as an artist, okay? So if you're an artist, if you're singing other people's material and you're not writing your own, you're only getting paid as an artist. And I can, I can drill down, you know, Francisca, if you, after I go through this overview, you can certainly, we can drill down into something deeper. If you're a lyricist only, right, you're only writing the words, you're not contributing to any of the music, then you're a lyricist. If you're also writing melodies, so you're, you might be what's called the top line songwriter, which is what I do. So I'm not a, I'm not a composer on the underscore. I don't write the keyboard parts and all the, the band, you know, I don't do all the arrangement. I just do the top line. It's actually the term you should write down is top line. 
L-I-N-E. So that means that you're writing the lyrics and the melody, okay? You might also be the vocal arranger. What is that? So then you're actually arranging all the background vocals. I do that too. <laughs> so, but you know, that's kind of on the production side of things. Um, if you're the producer, you know, you hear uh, in a lot of, um, a lot of contemporary terminology, the word producer. And if that person is also creating the underscore of the music, they're also a composer, but it's kind of a term that gets mixed up a lot. So the composer is the person who's actually composing the music and the producer is the person who's bringing it to life. And there's also an arranger, but arrangers don't get royalties. So there's a lot of different streams here. What are you? What's, what gets a royalty and what doesn't, right? So they're excited. Hold on. Royalty. And what's a yeah. royalty? For anyone who doesn't know, what's a royalty? Okay, great. So a royalty is a part of the sale, and it's based on a percentage. In the record industry, you'll also hear this referred to as points. So if you're offered a record deal and they say, we want to give you eight points on a record, first of all, that's abysmally small. The average is 12 to 14. Make sure you write that down. And if for just the artist side of things, the range for points, which is percentage of the sale of the record, is 12 to 14%. If someone's offering you less, you call, tell them, you come call me. Um, so points is, is percent. So one point is 1%, two points is 2%, et cetera. That is a, a piece of the revenue pie. And another thing I'll just cover here, and if I go out of order, just let me know and I can backtrack on any of these topics. But when it comes to a song, when you hear a song on the radio, you're actually hearing two different revenue streams at the same time. One is the performance, which is, has everything to do with the vocal, the production, the instrumental performance, all of the things that you hear. But then the composition can be, is just, it's its own merit. So that's a separate pie. It's like having two different pies on the table. One is the performance pie and one is the composition pie. Lyrics, melody, and, and the score, that all falls under composition. So that's a totally different revenue stream than the performance. And that's why it gets really hairy. And that's why um, when we talk about what you need to protect and also what other people are protecting and like what you need to do, we're going to get into some of that. And I'm going to follow Francisca's questions because I want to make sure I go in the order that's great for your audience. Thank you. So is that, so that, okay, so we, we spoke about royalties. We yep. spoke about, uh, so what do you do if you want to Put out your own music. So, so the first step is knowing what you're what you are in the mix. Okay. So let's make it really easy for the point of the, the examples here because you know there's so many different ways that this can be a matrix and like a Tetris game and like Rubik's Cube. So let's just make it really straightforward, just for example sake. So let's say you are a singer songwriter. So you are writing your, your lyrics, you're writing your melody, and maybe you're, you're writing, you know, writing the, the underscore on piano or guitar or whatever it is. Um, you should know an important thing though, <laughs> that the score, if it's just chords, is that alone is not copyrightable. The copyright is what you need to register. I'm gonna talk about that in a second. But the chords by themselves and the chord progression, like A to G, that, that to F to A, <laughs> is not copyrightable alone. The lyrics and the melody, though, are. So if you don't play an instrument, but you're a songwriter and you're a top line writer, you can copyright your lyrics and melody, and that constitutes the copyright on the whole song. So if you have a co-writer, though, we're going to talk a little bit about that in a minute, because then you have somebody else to consider. And I want to definitely touch base with you on some of those issues. Again, this is a really cursory overview of really complex stuff. So I'm going to get into the end. I'm going to give you access to another resource for me as well. But this is just kind of the overview. So the first thing that you want to do, if you have original work, let's say that you wrote all of your songs and you've you can, you're the only person on it. We're just going to use that as the example because it's the easy one. You're the only person that wrote the song. So what you need to do is let's say you have 10 songs. So then you would go to the Library of Congress in the United States. And also you can do this through, through Akum in Israel. But if you use, if you're American, I do suggest using the Library of Congress. It's a better option. Yeah. 
Okay, great. So ASCAP is not where you register your copyright. So I can talk, talk about that in a second. Yay. Yeah, so, so ASCAP is not where you register your copyright. Neither is BMI, neither is CSAC. Those are performance rights organizations and that's a totally different um, part of the conversation. You need that, but it's not the copyright. So the copyright, if you're in the United States, I really recommend you only register through the Library of Congress if you're American. If you are Israeli only, you would go through ACUM, A-C-U-M. If you're Canadian only, you would go through SOCAN, and every single country has its own. But if you are American, please use the Library of Congress. And the the registration is through copyright.gov and it brings you to an online portal. You sign up for the portal and you can register a group of unpublished works. It's 10 songs. It's funny that there's, a, there's actually something on YouTube that says it's 20, but they recently changed it and it's 10. Um, and I know that because I actually got an email from them. So it is 10 songs um, that you can register at once under what's called a group Registration of Unpublished Works, G-R-U-W. And again, you have to be the exclusive writer on that, or if you have a co-writer, it has to be the same writers for all of those songs. Otherwise, you need to have a separate registration. So if you have eight songs by you, and then two songs by you and someone else, you can register the eight, but the other two would have to be either grouped or if they're by different people, separately registered. And the registration cost is not that inexpensive. It is $65 per registration. But once I tell you what it protects, you'll be like, oh, I need that. <laughs> I need that. Um, and we can get into that whenever you're ready. But, um, you know, so that's the protection of the copyright of, this, of the work. And it's through a form called Form PA. The recording has, there's another few layers to that. And then who would own the sound recording is the person who paid for the recording to be done. So it might be you, but it could be your record label. So you may not own the copyright to your sound recording, which is another thing that people have to understand that when you are doing what's called exploiting the work, exploiting is such a bad word in, in other ways, but when it comes to music industry, exploiting is the word. It means that's what you're getting it out there. So if you have a record label that you're signed to, you may not own all of the master. And if you don't own the master, you can't exploit the master. You can't put it out there without the record company's permission. You might own part of it. And if you do, you have a say. So, you know, that's the thing, you know, sometimes someone will be on a label and they're all excited and they've got signed and they're like, oh, I'm going to put this on my Facebook, but the label hasn't given you permission to do it yet. Uh oh, that's not a, that's not going to work. So there's a lot of nuance in all of the copyright administration stuff. I want to explain what copyrights protect. Is that okay, Francisca? Yeah, let's go into that. Okay, definitely. great. So a copyright is a federal registration, which means that it has federal rights. It's federally protected, which means if somebody violates your copyright, it's a federal offense and it's very serious. So this is one thing that I really, I, I, I'm like, at first I can be, everyone gets irritated with me and they start to argue, oh, that, but what about this? And I'm not getting paid, make, making money. It doesn't matter if you're making money and I'll explain to you why. So one, the copyright protects the work itself, right? It protects the right to, first of all, you can guess, to copy it. So meaning making digital copies, making sheet music copies, making audio copies, any kind of copying is the number one. It also protects the performance of it. So it's the right to copy, the right to perform, the right to display. Display, that's an interesting one, right? So if you have sheet music and you put it up online, it's a display. If you put up a video, it's a display. Um, it's the right to distribute, right? To put it out and get it out, to sell it, to share it, to anything it, to make, make not only copies, but push it out. So whether it's putting it to radio, sharing it with your friends, putting it on YouTube, on Facebook, all of that is considered distribution. And the last one is interesting. It's the right to make, to authorize derivative works. So this is where the cover song question comes in, right? So we have, uh, and I'm gonna speak, speak to a very specific thing about cover songs and derivative work. So a derivative work means you are the only one who can decide if somebody can take some of your copyright and make it into something else, okay? And cover songs are a little bit different because if it's a straight cover song, there's, there's easy ways to do that. 
But once you start going into, oh, but I'm going to change the lyrics because I want to make it a little different for this, that becomes derivative work and that's what gets sticky. So we're going to talk about that in a minute too. So the copyright protects all of those things for you. Now, in addition to being a protection, it lasts for the entire duration of your life plus 90 years. And it also is something that goes into your estate. It's actually an asset and it has, it's considered intellectual property, which has no fixed value. And it, that's, it actually can have infinite value. And a matter of fact, um, songs that were in catalogs by people like Bob Dylan just sold to another catalog for 300 million that Bob Dylan walked away with because 300 million, he's like, okay, I'll sell it to that publisher for that. It has infinite value. And that's one thing I really wanna make sure that songwriters understand. This is not stuff that has, that like floats away. This is real, tangible. It's intangible as an asset, but because it doesn't have an immediate value now, but the potential is huge. And you never know when it's gonna become valuable and at what, what level. And when somebody infringes your copyright, meaning they do something that's not, that violates one of those five things we talked about, you're not only entitled to the actual damages, like, okay, let's say they made $400. Okay, that's considered the actual damage. Okay, now if you file within the statute of limitations, which is two years from discovery, and you have your copyright registered with the Library of Congress, if it's not registered, you still have a copyright when you make the tangible recording or put it on paper, but it's not legally protected. It's just considered that that's the, that's the date of creation, but creation date is not registration date. Registration date is when you are protected from. So when you register your copyright and you get your file number back and somebody violates the copyright, then you can pursue that and it's considered, um, oh my goodness, uh-oh, sorry. Um, it's considered, excuse me, one second, friends, I'm just gonna hit, yeah, okay. <laughs> I apologize, I thought that was off. <laughs> so sorry. So um, when you register your copyright and somebody violates it, you actually get federal protection. So they have to pay actual damages plus triple actual damages, plus perceived damages, potential value, pain and suffering, and they might go to prison for up to five years. Wow. So when somebody violates a copyright, it's serious business because it is federal. Um, now, there's a big, huge myth that people have, and I think it still exists. Oh, but what if I record my song and I put it on tape or I write it down and, and then I mail it, it to myself? To myself. Yeah. That is a big, big myth and never, ever, ever does it work. It used to work up until 1976. 1976, though, the copyright law changed, and it's changed many times since then. <laughs> there's a lot of iterations, especially now with digital rights. Um, but 1976 was the last time you could mail yourself a package, leave it unopened and prove it in court. Okay, so don't go mailing it to yourself, <laughs> you know, and if you need help, we, we can help you to get your copyright registered. But that's, that's the importance of copyright registration. That's number one, the first thing you do before anybody else sees your song. Yes, absolutely. Okay, so number two. What if you are working with someone else or uh, a male singer approached you and wants to use your music, your songs? I wasn't using the pop culture. I'm sorry. That's okay. <laughs> um, and so you want to do this, you know, from the beginning, you want to do it well. So what do you do then? Okay. So there's two issues you raised. One is if somebody else wants to use your song. And the other is what if you're working with somebody else, right? So if you're working with somebody else, you have to decide who is what on the copyright, right? So let's say you work with a co-writer, okay? Now, if you wrote the lyrics and the melody and they just wrote the score, then you would copyright it as a joint copyright, but then you would have to do what's called a split sheet, which basically says that you're entitled to your portion a little bit more because you wrote two parts and they wrote one, but that's what you would do when you register that with the performance rights organization, which is what 
Francesca was talking about earlier, which is ASCAP in the United States, ASCAP, BMI, and CSAC, you have to be invited to join. So I'm just gonna focus on ASCAP and BMI for the purpose of this conversation. That's where they, that's the people that goes and tracks your songwriter royalties. So they're the ones who collect on your behalf, your songwriter royalties, and if you are a publisher, or if your publishing company would then collect their royalties from them too. So it's ASCAP stands for the Association, I'm sorry, uh, the Association for Songwriters Composer, sorry, American Society for Composers and Song, Songwriters and, and Publishers, sorry, and then Composers and Publishers, and then BMI is Broadcast Media International. Okay, so those are the two main ones in the U.S. So we covered the first part of the question. And if, yep. if and somebody I'm, wants to use your song, what do yep. you do then? Right. So it's here's, already here's registered. A, right. So it's already registered, but have there's a big issue here. So if you have not released your song yet or it hasn't gone to any other artist to be used, that's considered a first use. So if an artist, whether it's, if it's you, then you're the first use, okay? And, and you release it, you're the first release. But let's say somebody comes to you, they've heard the song and they wanna be the first use, guess what? You can charge them whatever you want to be the license on the first use. You can charge them $100,000 if you want to. Hold on. Because the first use, you yeah? you already released your songs on iTunes, then you already... Then you're the first use, and, right. and that's so it. So you're saying yeah. if you haven't released anything yet, and you have mm -hmm. a song that hasn't been published yet, mm -hmm. then you can sell the first use for a lot of money. Okay. You, you should license the first use. Never, ever, ever sell, sell your songs. songs. Never sell. Thank you. Never sell. Okay. Never sell. Never sell. Unless, unless you really are not attached to the song and somebody offers you like a crazy amount of money and you're like, okay, and you still might get something on the back end, especially, like you can sell it for exclusive license, but you should always try to keep something on the back end if you can. But some people do decide to sell. I mean, there are works for hire also where someone's like working for a songwriting house and they're like, anything you write, you're getting a salary. That's considered a different issue because they own the copyright. If it's a work for hire, you're getting paid and they're hiring you as a salary to write this music or be you know, on a contract, they own the copyright, you don't, but you got paid. So there are different circumstances depending. But if somebody came to you and they, your song's never been released and this person wants to really release it, you have a right to say no and you have a right to you have a right to charge whatever you want and under whatever terms you want, it, it's like your call. However, after that, let's say this person you've you've released your song it's been on itunes or spotify and Bandcamp and all these places and um someone wants to do a new rendition um that's a cover song <laughs> so what they have to do is they have to procure um, what's called a mechanical license now a mechanical license only covers the recording of the song and it's printing on cd or on physical um, you know, on any kind of physical medium and also digital. They have a digital package as well. So they would license X percent. But in order to do that, you need to be, have your copyright registered and you need to be with a performance rights organization. You still can license a mechanical, which means that they're not allowed to even record it until they have the mechanical, which is, we're going to get into that a little bit more with cover songs. But they have to pay 9.1 cents per unit pressed. Now pressed is like, well, what is that? So every, let's say they're gonna make 500 CDs, they pay for the, those upfront at a rate of 9.1 cents per unit. And there are different rates for digital and they have different packages for digital based on uh, volume. So there is a kind of a sliding scale, but they have to pay for that upfront before they can even hit the studio. And then they hit the studio and now, yeah. And then the other thing to know is like, if it's your song, but it's in a different language, but it's exactly the same words, it's a direct translation, that's still a cover song. If they want to change anything though, it becomes a derivative work and that gets a little more complicated. Okay. Okay. So we have the mechanical license. I'm going to have to talk to you about that after yeah. this podcast. Sure. Okay. Number three is let's say you are one of the artists I have recently interviewed and you have been, I don't know, licensing, selling, I don't even know what word to put on to some of the horrible, horrible experiences in terms of looking at royalty 
lost royalty, mm-hmm. um, what do they do now? Let's say you wrote a song and somebody famous sang it and you gave them permission originally five million years ago before anyone mm-hmm. knew about anything. Mm-hmm. Um, what happens now? What are your rights? What should you do? What can you do? So I hate to be the bearer of bad news on this one. Nothing. But if you gave permission, you put your song out and let somebody else, you know, put it out there and you didn't register your copyright, not only are you not entitled to anything, but this is even scarier. And I hate to be the one to say it, but if you don't register your copyright, someone else can. And so your song can be literally taken out from underneath you and you will have absolutely no recourse. Um, so that's why this stuff is so important. And, and Francisca, I'm so glad you said at the beginning how passionate you are about getting the word out about this because I'm like stamping my feet and I'm like, just because we're in the Jewish world does not mean we're escaping these things. And as a matter of fact, I want to also kind of put a side note in there that most of these rules were made by Jewish people. So <laughs> but let me go more to it. Like we are so into like, not stealing other people's things and you would think when it comes to intellectual property there would be that same respect and there is a complete just ignorance about this issue right it's definitely not intention nobody ever intends to steal i mean you just don't think about it because you don't you know and and especially you know the, the social media side of things has made this a little bit more confusing and there are ways to do things that are completely kosher and fine but it's just a certain approach you have to take and make sure that you're following those things. Um, you know, and also I hear a lot of people use the word parody. Um, and the word parody is P A R O D Y is actually used really incorrectly most of the time. Right. So because just because you're changing the lyrics does not mean it's a parody. No, no, no. (laughs) Parody is really specific has really specific rules, it has really specific length of time, it has a specific purpose. Just because you're making it into something funny does not, or changing the words does not mean it's a parody. It's considered a derivative work most of the time, right? So if someone took the song and made it huge and is not being bakavod the fact that you wrote it and they're not helping you out on the you know and doing what's right by you well you you can i mean let me let me explain this if you have proof of creation you have some recourse but i hate to say that unfortunately in court the first thing the first thing the judge is going to say did you register your copyright and if you say no they're going to say case dismissed and the reason for that a lot of people say, well, I didn't know, I didn't know. And you may not have known, but what I'm trying to be really talkless about is if you're an artist and a songwriter, it's your business to know, right? It's yeah. critically, it's like, it's like um, having your driver's license, right? You can't get on the, in a car, drive a car, hit and say, a pole I didn't know. And, and say, I didn't know, right? You're like, well, why didn't you take the test? And why didn't you get your license? So it's kind of the same thing. Okay, um, so I think, you know, that's why preparedness is everything. And that's why um, there's a whole field of study on this. And, and there's definitely books to read, which I can recommend. Um, but, you know, there is a lot of guidance, I think, that's needed with this stuff, too. Because even when you're reading the books, I mean, let's face it. For myself, I read all the books. I had a four-year course of study in, like, deep music publishing and music legal issues coursework and also 25 years of experience doing it, right? Uh, And actually 25 at the professional level, but then also at the amateur level before that. So it's not like it's straightforward, simple, you know, chick chocky got it done. It's like stuff you really need to like get help with. It's not, you know, Um, but you know, if someone ran off with your song, you can try to, you get a, a lawyer involved, an entertainment lawyer who specializes in music, not just a general entertainment lawyer, and definitely not a regular lawyer, I and mean, even just any lawyer. Get a music lawyer who can write a really great letter that scares them a little bit, that says, hey, we, you know what you did is wrong, make right. And if they won't make right, I hate to say if it has to go to litigation, if you don't have your copyright registered, you could be facing a very big disappointment, unfortunately. Yeah. Okay, so I think we covered all the main topics. Let's go mm-hmm. a little bit deeper into, did you want to go a little deeper into cover art, 
cover work or you yeah yeah i think we should because i think i think that's a major issue that people are super confused by yeah. right um oh, so, so first and foremost, just, sorry uh, okay so yeah. to clarify you register the work and then you go to uh, an ASCAP or BMI and you register there so you could get your royalties. Yeah. Then, and then that's it. You're, you're good to go. I mean, usually, I mean, and well, let's just, there's a whole other aspect, which is music publishing, right? So the general rule of thumb, and I actually have a whole course series on this that I just completed and it's, I have it available for people who want to register for it. Um, but it's music publishing is a whole other side of this too. So you're not the only one who owns it, but you're, you own everything until you give some of it away. And the music publishing course was a five unit, like six, seven hour you know, course, <laughs> six or seven hours worth of course. So I can't, we don't have time for that here, but, but there's a whole lot to learn on the music publishing side and performance rights, like what, how you make your money, how you earn money, what streams are available. So I can give you a little bit at the end of how to be in touch with me about that too. But Assuming that you've registered your copyrights and you've registered, you've become affiliated with a performance rights organization. Now, if you're an artist, I just want to stick this in there too. So if you're the recording artist and let's say you paid for all your recordings, you own all your masters, let's just make it simple for this, this example. Then you also would register the sound recording copyright, which is a separate copyright and unfortunately a separate fee, but you then would go on to sound exchange and register the sound recording, which tracks the performance royalties. So you as the performer would also get your cut and your producer, if you had a producer, would get a piece too. So again, two different pies, two different ways to protect it and to register it and to make sure you're getting all your income streams. Okay. It's slow to distribute, anyone, but at least you get it. For anyone listening, I have messed up on some of these things and I'm going to sign up for your course and I might even have to work with you one-on-one -on -one just to make sure I avoid any uh, bad situations because I'm about to enter some um, some wh whatever some bigger like, space some projects no some projects that just involve more people than just myself. okay great and I want to navigate this properly so anyone listening 100%. don't think like that's it I give up on the whole thing now I have to start registering everything everywhere and start paying a ton of money and I still haven't earned anything like I can just hear someone thinking that to themselves yeah I'm in the same boat with you and I'm going to probably go and spend a bunch of hundred dollars <laughs> on 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 you know on making sure everything is dotted all the t's are crossed because right. I'm there might be loopholes going on right I mean and everyone every Everyone is like super ready to like spend the fantastic amount of money on their outfits the recording. and the recording and the promotion and marketing, all of these things. But like the most basic fundamental has to be addressed first, right? And um, to if now for BMI to affiliate as a songwriter only, the last time I checked and it could change, it was free and then they have an affiliation cost for publishers. Um, for ASCAP, it is a $50 fee, but Again, I'll tell you, I chose ASCAP because it represent, it's representing um, the foundation of ASCAP was, was created by people that compose and write songs. BMI was founded by the broadcast companies. So it's a little bit, they're both equally good and equally reputable, but I have my own reasons for having chosen ASCAP, but you have to look and see what works best for you. Um, but they're both completely 100% above board and excellent and have thousands and thousands and thousands of members that are um, they look after which also means that they pay extraordinarily slowly but that's okay they pay <laughs> okay so um okay did we cover everything so i think we want to talk about cover songs a little bit Let's right talk about cover songs yeah okay so let me go from the the there's two different scenarios happening. So one, one is that you have a cover song that you want to, you love this song. You know, you want to, you want to sing dreams by Fleetwood Mac. You want to record it. And you're like, Oh yes, I need to record that. It's gotta be on my album. And so you have to actually go to a place called song file, which is through the Harry Fox agency. Again, this is in the United States. If you live in Israel, you can do this through Akum. And song file in the United States is an organization that, um, helps you procure the mechanical rights, the mechanical license only. 
So this is for only the pressing of CDs or other physical units, cassette, vinyl, disc on key, flash drive, you name it, and digital. So you'd have, you can buy digital packages too. And again, it's for a fixed rate. This does not cover if you make a music video. A music video is a whole other animal called the synchronization license. And now there is kind of a gray area because you're not supposed to actually make the video with you singing this cover song, even record it without a synchronization license, which comes from the publisher. The publisher and the songwriter, if they have say in it, the artist has no say in any of this. Only people who have rights to these are songwriters and publishers. The artist, you could know the artist, they, you could go to tea at their house, they could say, oh, sure, they have no say. Unless they also wrote it, but that's a whole other, again, that's a different job. So once you put it into, want to put it into a moving picture, it becomes a synchronization license. And that is not compulsory. They have to let you make a cover recording. They have to let you make a cover record, but they do not have to allow you to make a cover video. Okay. And so a cover, a video is called the synchronization license. And that's putting the song to a moving picture. And that license is not compulsory. They can say no. They can charge you a million dollars. It's, it's all up to them. Now, where the gray area lies a little bit is with Facebook and YouTube. They have their own licenses kind of in place. But again, there's supposed to be kind of limitations on how long you can post it. You might see that your video is up there for two months and all of a sudden it's shut down because they have a limitation of that license. So it's based on advertising. There's a whole lot of stuff that's happening in the back end with social media. Um, and again, it depends. Oh, is that song administered under the publishing of one of our affiliates, right? So you could see that everything by Sony is fine, but then stuff by Warner Music or you know or EMI is pulled down because they don't have a they don't have a deal with them for that block of time. And it actually is time chunks. So it's really better not to do a video because you, you, you face the liability of having it pulled down, but then there are other liabilities. Why did you make this video in the first place without a sync license? Mm -hmm. So it gets a little hairy. So but, if you but, get, yeah. But there is one caveat. I think with Facebook, they have a thing like if you do a live story, like a story, not a post, not a, not a post on your, on your newsfeed or your wall, but a story that's limited in time, right. right? And it's live. It's not like you're going into the studio and shooting it. It's like an ad hoc kind of thing at a concert or whatever. They let you do that, but they also can pull it down. But it's kind of a gray area. So, and what about the performing end of things? Like people who take other, other artists' music and they use it when they perform. In a live show? Yeah. Okay, so live show is a totally different thing. Okay, so a live show, if you're performing in a venue, which means like a club, a performance hall, a theater, a, a college campus, okay? All of these places have to pay a license. A restaurant, they have to pay a license to ASCAP, BMI, and CSAC. They have to pay three different licenses, you know, based on how much quote unquote entertainment happens in their space. And then they go through and they have, they're paying for it. So when their bands come in to perform or their, you know, their singer songwriters night, their, you know, their folk night or whatever, all the songs that are performed that night are covered. You might have to provide a set list to the venue to know because they have to report to ASCAP, BMI, and CSAC what was played. Okay, just like radio has to report what was played on their show. Mm -hmm. um, but you, you yourself individually are not responsible. So you can, you can be a wedding singer and sing in every simcha, every cover song known to Hashem and man, and that's fine. Wow. But not recording it. <laughs> not recording it. Right. <laughs> and there is so much more here. There is just so much more. I know this is just the beginning of the conversation. Yeah, it's tip of the iceberg. <laughs> tip of the iceberg. Um, okay. So for anyone who decides, you know what, this is, a, an, you know, a wake up call for me. I have to do something about this. What do they do next? How can you help them? Okay, so the first thing I can do is I can tell you that I have a class that's already been recorded. So it was five units long, all about copyright issues, all the different varieties of music publishing scenarios, performance rights, 
cover songs, to a degree cover songs was covered, <laughs> cover songs was covered, um, licensing issues, all of that was in this five unit course, which I make available for subscription and it's audio and you can go at your own pace. It also comes with some other resources and also you can reach out to me to ask questions about it, like super, super accessible that way. And then actually on Sunday, I'm doing a course on cover songs specifically. So that's kind of a drill down and that one's just for the ladies. The copyright song had a mixed class, but it's audio only. Um, but this class is just for the ladies, the one, the cover songs on Sunday night, Israel time. And that's going to get into a lot more detail on the things that we talked about. And the good news is if this goes to podcast after that is happening, then it's also going to be recorded and you can access it through subscription to me too. So, uh, and again, with the same resources, access to me, ask questions, et cetera. So this is what I do. Okay. And we're going to post the links in the show notes, correct? So hundred sure percent. I have all the links. I will and, certainly get them to you. And yeah. So Darcy, thank you so much for coming onto the show, onto this podcast and really driving home some very unexciting, unexciting. <laughs> information. But it's stuff. super exciting if you're on the other side of it. Like if your work's protected and you can go to sleep at night knowing that you're covered and you've done everything right. And, and you know that, your stuff is is tucked in tight and i want to thank you for being an advocate on this issue because i think so many artists don't understand it's not that they, they want to do anything incorrectly or halfway they don't understand the implications and the benefits that they can get and did you guys know that if you do all this stuff and you start to get out there you can actually once you you've passed a certain release point you should be getting into the recording academy and getting nominating you know, getting into the sphere of getting nominated for Grammys. That's where this puts you, right? Yeah. So if you're like an artist who's got tons of stuff out there, you qualify as a voting member, you can vote for the Grammy Awards, which means we have a voice. And also, if you're in these or professional organizations, you have a voice of how things are advocated for in Washington. We actually become part of the music industry when we actually become part of the music industry. And how incredible would it be if all of a sudden the floodgates of from performing artists were flooding the industry? I'm just going to leave it there. I love that. We'll end on that high note. We will post all the links. And for anyone who doesn't want to click on links, how do they find you the fastest way? One place. Okay. One place. I'm going to say it easily. Intent impact marketing at gmail.com. So I I-N-T-E-N-T, -E that's intense, impact, I-M-P-A-C-T, marketing at gmail.com. You can email me anytime. I'm also on Facebook too. Amazing. Thank you so much, Darcy. Thank you, Francisca. It's great to be with you.